Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Continuing our in-studio series on vintage plastic kits, we have a really neat episode for you today. We're going to be talking about aircraft carrier kits in the 1950s. But before we talk about the carriers, let's talk about where they came from. I have here a Lindbergh F7U Cutlass kit. Anybody who built this remembers the beautiful fluorescent blue plastic and what it looked like when you put silver paint on that exhaust uh, cone. It was really just a spectacular experience. The Lindbergh kits predated Ravel by a good two years. So we're looking at a 1953 kit here and you notice on the box top that the airplane is approaching or uh, circling over an aircraft carrier. Let's open up the Lindbergh Cutlass kit and see this incredible model. Look at the color of that plastic. Again, to be an early stage modeler at this point and to uh, have this kind of a model to build, the airplane itself was very futuristic with the twin tail. It was essentially a flying wing jet. In actuality, it wasn't that great an airplane. It uh, was underperforming due to engine thrust and it just was not a, a, a great successful Navy airplane. But that didn't uh, detract from the fact that as a model, this was a beautiful uh, airplane to build. Relatively simple. Uh, here you see the direction sheet, the decal sheet, and uh, it was a beautiful model in its day. And now let's talk about how that relates to the USS Wasp from Lindbergh also. The first model in this series is the Lindbergh USS Wasp. It's a World War II aircraft carrier, and it was a breakthrough kit in its day. In looking at the Lindbergh Wasp kit, we have to take note of the box art of this era. And I say this with great love and respect for the artists of that time period. Ray Gadke was an airbrush artist, kind of the king of the airbrush artists for model box tops with his Lindbergh covers. They were spectacular. But they were also uh, overly dramatic. Every single gun on the ship is firing while every single airplane is doing something, revving and taxiing and taking off on the catapults or whatever. And it's a scene that would never in actuality take place. But to a young modeler, it just showed all the uh, action features of the carrier and uh, it really drew you in and made you want to uh, purchase it. Uh, this kit in, in 1953 dollars was $1.98. That's a lot of allowance and a lot of uh, lawnmower or new, uh, newspaper route money uh, to save up to buy a kit like this, but believe me, once you got it home, it was definitely worth it. Let's take a look inside and see how these parts go together. When we open up the Lindbergh USS Wasp kit, we notice the direction sheet which is unique in that it uses photographs of the real model as well as the standard Lindbergh catalog printed at the bottom. It's a beautifully done uh, example of direction sheets in those days. The plastic is fairly robust. It, uh, I remember as a young lad looking at this and it seemed like the plastic was an eighth of an inch thick, uh, really heavy duty, but it reflected the World War II feel of the ship at that time. You'll notice that all the airplanes are Grumman F6F Hellcats. There's a nice array of the 156 parts in the kit. Uh, something unique to this model was the hangar deck, which was actually a piece of cardboard which would be inserted in the uh, hull halves to represent the hangar deck of the carrier. You have your flag sheet, your direction sheet, and uh, all the detail parts uh, as you see here, and the flight deck in one piece with the elevators. This is an interesting contrast to the Forrestal kit where the elevators were moved to the edge of the deck to allow unobstructed uh, traffic on the flight deck itself. So here you've got an example of the 1953 Lindbergh USS Wasp. In 1954, Ravel arrived in the hobby shops in a big way, literally. They had the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt. This was a uh, new class of carrier right at the end of World War II and this was a spectacular model and I know this was one of my first kits of this magnitude that I built as a Cub Scout in uh, Long Island, New York and uh, it felt like it took a week to put all the parts together. Uh, it had a, you paint the deck tan for the wooden deck and it was just a beautiful model when it went together. We're going to open it up in a second but I want to just mention that like the Wasp, the box art was unique you are literally standing on the wing of a uh, Grumman F9 Panther as another one is about to touch down and a third one is about to catch the wire. Totally impossible, would never happen. Coming in from the wrong direction, a carrier pattern is left-handed. But uh, it didn't matter. You looked at this and it was a compelling scene that drew you in uh, and made you want to buy the, the model. 
So let's take a look inside the uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt and look at how different it was from the USS Wasp. In looking at the Ravel USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, there are some significant differences between this and the Lindbergh Wasp kit. For starters, the hull of the uh, Roosevelt is in one piece. This is called a waterline model because it's devoid of details such as propellers. It does have rudders, but it's uh, basically like the ship was sitting in the water uh, versus the Wasp, which shows the entire hull structure of the ship. Uh, the biggest thing to uh, comment on here is that for a uh, 11 or 12 year old modeler, uh, this was fairly intricate. The pieces were very small and this is back in the day when you were using tube cement or maybe brush on cement. Uh, this wasn't at the skill level that uh, today's modelers operate with tweezers and magnifiers and things like that. So this was a very complex kit to build from scratch out of the box. However, the end result was fantastic. Uh, as I said, it was a wood deck. Uh, little dark blue uh, navy sea blue airplanes uh, to paint and put on the ship and it really was a, a, a substantial model when you were done uh, and had it on the stand in your room but as good as this kit was in 1954 there was something on the horizon that was even more spectacular and we're going to look at that one right now this is a rare collectible it's the Ravel Promo for their new supercarrier, the USS Forrestal, CVA-59. The ship was launched in the mid-50s, went into service in 1957. This represented the future of naval aviation at that time. It was the Navy's first angle deck carrier built that way from initial construction, and uh, it was the beginning of the jet age. The new aircraft on this uh, included in the kit the F-7U Cutlass, uh, the F-2H Banshee, the A3D Sky Warrior uh, it was just a revolutionary model uh, in 1956. It was molded in two different colors. We're going to see that in a moment looking into the box. But this ad said it all. At $2.98, this was a fairly substantial uh, model. You would either hope for it as a gift at Christmas or for your birthday from a special aunt. And uh, this was really uh, the name of the game in terms of the peak of Ravel S kits in 1956. Let's take a look at the box and talk a little more about the USS Forrestal. This was a large box, 23 inches long, almost 3 inches uh, deep. This was really a substantial kit. The box art is by Scott Eidson and it's a real action scene. You can see the A3D, the whale, uh, launching from the angle deck catapult. You have an F7 cutlass launching off the bow catapult. All sorts of other action, the carrier steaming along in the, uh, in the Pacific. And uh, it's just something that, to this day, is one of the most compelling Ravel covers ever painted. Uh, the kit, as I said, represented a huge uh, breakthrough. It was molded in two different colors. Let's take a look at that uh, kit inside and talk about some of the real features of this amazing aircraft carrier. When you open the box of the Ravel Forrestal, a number of unique features meet your eye that had never been done in any other Ravel kit. To begin with, the flight deck is protected by a tissue wrap and this keeps all the deck etching and detail in good shape. Uh, the hull is one piece and the uh, direction sheet is printed in black and red. But most important are the decals. There had never been a decal sheet in a Ravel kit this detailed. All the deck line, the warning lines around the deck elevators, the catapult lines, the barrier uh, lines, the little markings on the airplanes. Each airplane had its own national insignia, Navy markings for the wing. Uh, it really required some dexterity and some care and skill uh, to get all those markings on those little airplanes, but it was worth it. Uh, so as complex as this was, one step at a time, the direction sheet was really, really excellent in delineating how uh, you would put the small sub-assemblies together. Those would create larger sub-assemblies that would go to the hull or the flight deck or the island. And step by step, you were building a beautiful scale replica of the Navy's newest super aircraft carrier. In the automotive world, the big three consisted of GM, Ford, and Chrysler. In the model universe, among the big three were Ravel, Monogram, and Aurora. Wanting to compete with Ravel, Aurora jumped into the aircraft carrier game with their version of the USS Forrestal, also released in 1956. The box art was by Joe Catula, who could not only paint airplanes, but ships as well, as you can see here. And you notice the A-4 Skyhawk and the F-8 Crusader circling above the carrier. 
it was a very uh, dramatic and compelling uh, piece of box art. And the kit, while not as sharp in detail as the Ravel Forestall, had a charm unto its own. Let's take a look inside the box and see what these parts look like. Opening up the Aurora Forestall kit, we see some interesting features that are different from Ravel. For starters, the airplanes are molded in a light gray plastic versus the battleship gray for the ship. And you notice here it's in the original stapled poly bag as it was packed in 1956 at Aurora's plant in West Hempstead, New York. The direction sheet have a very novel feature. Uh, you can see here in this close-up, it has a deck plan to show you where the airplanes are going to be parked. And even though this isn't accurate to the way the Navy was parking uh, tail over water and tail over deck aircraft in the day, it made for a very nice looking model. What you see here is a factory buildup of Aurora's USS Forrestal kit. These buildups were given to hobby shops and toy stores as incentives to help sell the kit and show the prospective model builders what the kit would look like when it was finished. Let's compare the buildups of the Aurora and Ravel USS Forrestal kits. There are some interesting differences and some interesting similarities as well. First thing that strikes your eye is that the Ravel carrier is two inches longer than the Aurora. The deck detail on the Ravel kit is engraved into the blue deck, whereas most of the deck detail on the Aurora kit is done with the decals. There are more airplanes on the Aurora deck than on the Ravel kit, and they are different. While Ravel has the larger A3D Sky Warrior, uh, the Aurora kit has the Grumman Tiger and the Douglas A4D Sky Hawk. They do share the HUP-2 Rescue Helicopters and the F7U Cutlass. But most importantly, the Aurora kit has a more organic look to it. It's a pretty model. This is a factory buildup from West Hempstead. You can see the nameplate on the turquoise base. And the Ravel kit has a different feel. It is more massive. The deck elevators operate, and it is just a more substantial kit for that time period. Each one special unto itself, and uh, either one would be a very worthy uh, Christmas present or birthday present for a young modeler in 1956. So there you have it, a look at the four aircraft carrier kits that represented the epitome of modeling in the 1950s and how they relate to today's kits. These were steps on the way to the incredibly detailed, beautiful kits of today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We have many more to bring to you on the live in-studio series of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Until next time, take care.